Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, this is our third webinar in the last three months. Uh, the objective of these webinars from BCWF's perspective uh, is twofold. Uh, the big piece is education. We're looking to get science and data and management um, goals out in front of the public and our membership. And the big thing behind that is also the advocacy piece. Science only gets us so far today. And where the rubber really hits the road is talking about these issues that these scientists tell us about and having these conversations about fish, wildlife and habitat, sustainability and restoration with your neighbors, friends, and most importantly, your elected officials. Um, Rob's gonna cover a whole bunch of issues tonight. Um, it's gonna be, you know, you're gonna learn a lot and there's gonna be a whole bunch of different things that kind of hit you from different directions. And I think the big thing that we'd like to see out of this is that you take all of this knowledge and this education and you use it to engage um, with the public and especially with our elected officials to help drive the policy piece and the education piece um, with our elected officials in Victoria and Ottawa. Um, so the format tonight uh, will be Rob uh, Bison is going to give us a presentation probably about 45 minutes to an hour. After that we'll go into a question and answer period. Rob does work for the provincial government so in his role on this webinar he's going to provide you science. And when you ask question and answers, um, the, your questions are gonna have to be framed around science and not about policy or politicians necessarily. Uh, there are things that Rob in his capacity can't talk about. So um, we will be going through the questions that are asked. We'll be aggregating them and ask them to Rob at the end of it. But I would just keep in mind that when you're asking your questions, they should be tied to his presentation and tied to science and not tied to politicians. Um, because Rob can't speak to that. Um, in terms of the questions as well, please make sure that your name is on there. Uh, we're not, uh, not too keen on taking questions from anonymous people or people with names that uh, are not uh, living in reality. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Rob. Rob is a fisheries biologist with the provincial government. He's been working with the province since 1985. We we're just talking about that. I was four years old when he started his career with the province. Um, he's worked on steelhead uh, just about through his entire career. So he has probably more experience than just about anyone else in British Columbia on steelhead. He's worked in the Skeena, the Southern Interior, and even on the coast. Um, he's got experience. He knows the rivers. He knows the fish. Um, and tonight, uh, I'm really excited and pleased to have you come and talk to our membership and the public and uh, everyone participating. So from there, Rob, uh, take it away. Great, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, and thanks to uh, Christina and Martina who are running the show here and uh, for everyone for uh, signing in. So uh, the presentation is about, uh, is about sharing some of the technical information that we have to offer on the recovery and persistence, uh, questions around recovery and persistence of interior Fraser Steelhead. And, uh, and in, in, in addressing uh, what we understand with regards to recovery, we'll also talk a little bit about the available management levers and uh, what potential there seems to be in some of these levers. So, uh, as, Paul, as most of you are probably aware, we've undergone a considerable decline. Uh, the decline has been actually relatively gradual over about three or four decades. And most of the, most of the plots that get circulated like uh, during the in-season period and a lot of the plots that are associated with um, uh, conservation reference points or, or recovery targets, uh, there's a variety of them now. Um, a lot of, oftentimes those plots have are plots of the spawner abundance over time. But uh, these plots here is the reconstructed pre-fishery abundances. And because there was more losses from fisheries early in the time period, uh, the, the, the overall pattern is actually a more gradual one than if you were just to look, looking at how the pattern of spawning population abundances have changed over time. So that's what these are. And uh, on the subject of recovery, these obviously are useful because uh, you, can see, you can see what uh, the potential was in the past, uh, you know, on the scale of uh, some mid thousands for the Thompson. And Thompson is a collection of populations. Um, the Chilcotin is also a collection of populations, uh, about uh, two or three for the Chilcotin, depending on 
how you think about them, uh, and three or four for the Thompson. Um, and, and these are the components of interior phrase or steelhead that we have a long time series for. Uh, but I, I want to mention that there's other populations as well for which we don't have these kinds of data for, but we know enough about them that we know that they're in a, a, probably an equal state as these ones are, and those populations are, um, are, uh, are in the, if you're familiar with the watershed, are in the bridge watershed, uh, the Seton watershed, both near the community of Lillooet, and then the Stein uh, near Lytton, and uh, the Nahatlatch near Boston Bar. But uh, we most of the data we have are on these two groups of stocks, and so the, most of most of what's going to follow is going to be um, information evidence from from these. So uh, three to four decades of general decline, uh, and uh, it's self-evident that the recovery potential when environment mental conditions are favorable is that for each of these where we can uh, there has been a uh, potential to produce some thousands of fish mid thousands or low thousands in the case of Chilcotin but while the abundance has declined we've also noticed that the body size has declined um, best measured uh, with our data by just the maximum size uh, here, here, here is what um, uh, the biggest fish that you would encounter, the scale of the biggest fish that you would encounter, say in the 70s, what it looked like and how big it was. Uh, that's the scale on the left. And that's from a, a 30 pound fish, a female caught in 1975. Um, and, it, uh, and, and, and in those years, uh, and including including up to the mid 80s, but we started to see variability by the 80s, uh, the maximum size, we started to getting, uh, getting years where we weren't, weren't seeing those 30, 31, 32 pounders anymore. Um, but uh, we were seeing them pretty constantly in the, in the 70s. And uh, when, when we look at the scales, we noticed that uh, most, of the, most of the body size is put on during the half of their life that they're in the ocean. So we can see on the scale how how the ocean growth uh, is in comparison to the a representative of the biggest fish from the one on the right is from 2018. And that, that would be a, a good representation of the biggest fish that you would find uh, now um, at about 21 pounds. Um, when, when we read these scales uh, the, and we compare the two time periods, we can see that, uh, well, not only is the scale smaller, but uh, the, the steadiness of the growth during the marine phase, it was just not as steady. Uh, the winters are more clearly marked. Uh, and in some scales, we even see, uh, we see, we see periods uh, around during the winter time period where there seems to be a calcium resorption. So uh, just, uh, it's just, Overall, the, the, the growth is just not as smooth and steady as we used to see in the, in the 70s. So if we, um, the significance of, of fish getting smaller is that we would, the, then that would, that would indicate that the number of eggs that each female is carrying is gonna be less. So body mass and the number of eggs that a female will carry is uh, directly proportional. So it's possible that this decline in uh, the number of eggs that a female carries or the total number of eggs that a population would deposit uh, could potentially explain the decline in, in productivity. If the survival uh, after egg deposition, either say in the 70s or, to, or, or more recently, uh, were, if all those survivals were the same, a decline in fecundity could potentially explain some or all of the decline in productivity and the decline in abundance that we've observed. Um, so if we suppose that all the survival steps after egg deposition are constant and uh, we examine that, so basically if we correct for fecundity and we also have to correct for how many spawners there are because a population isn't equally productive when it's when there's few spawners and when there's lots of spawners, we have to standardize. And the way we standardize is uh, we standardize it as uh, uh, pretending or estimating what, how many, how many offspring a spawner would produce if it were the only one in the population. So the, the productivity at very low stock size. So that's what this plot is about. And we see that when we factor out, when we count for density and we factor out the fecundity, 
decline that we've observed, we still see a decline in productivity or another way of saying it, just that we still see a decline in survival. So that leads to the question, well, you know, what, might, what might be causing that? This just decline in body size isn't, isn't explaining all of what we're seeing. And all the while that this has happened, um, uh, we've, uh, we, have, we, have, we have information that indicates that the juvenile populations have not changed in abundance. Uh, this is from the Thompson watershed, the steelhead, bearing, the steelhead bearing waters of the Thompson watershed. And you can see that over quite a range of steelhead spawners, that there is a, 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 positive, a positive relationship with the number of young of the year, which are the fry, these yellow points. Um, uh, but then, uh, and that's about at about uh, uh, a half a year of age, like in, in, in their first in their first year uh, after they emerge. But after they go through the winter and they uh, go through the next spring and summer and, and into the next fall, then when they're one and a half years old, you can see that uh, that associate that there's no longer a positive association. And so what, basically what they're doing is they're really, they're filling up the available habitat very effectively. Now these, these, these one and a half year old juveniles, they're not, they're not smolts. Ideally we would like to measure smolts, but it's not feasible to do so in a watershed like the Thompson or, or uh, you know, conceptually at least you'd want to maybe even account for some productivity in the Fraser maybe, but, but even, even uh, uh, no one's even attempted to try to collect uh, smolts uh, leaving the Thompson watershed with all the salmon that, that go through as well. So the closest thing we can get to a measure of say small output is looking at these one and a half, the, uh, these one and a half year old juveniles that are about half a year away from, or about five months away from going uh, to sea if, if they go to sea as two year olds or about a one and a half year. But the point is here is that uh, the juvenile abundance has not declined. Uh, is what this evidence is suggesting. And for those people that work on this species, that's not too much of a surprise. Uh, their freshwater habitat when they rear is, uh, is uh, um, uh, modest to higher gradient temperate streams. And they're very good at filling it up. Here's an example from Kootenai Lake uh, for uh, Gerard rainbow trout. They're a big bodied rainbow trout that I th many of you are probably uh, are very familiar with. Um, and you can see here over a, quite a range of uh, egg deposition that the one and a half year old, the population of one and a half year olds in the system is really, uh, it's not very positively associated, okay? So as, as the abundance of spawners goes down or the number of egg deposits goes down, there's, it has to get down quite low before we see really strong increases in survival. And that's what helps keep the juvenile population stable. Here's another example from a steelhead population in northern Vancouver Island, where the province has conducted uh, monitoring for, uh, uh, for 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 many decades now, and uh, we see the same thing. It's really a feature of the species that they're really very good at filling up uh, that kind of habitat in those modest and higher gradient streams, and it really stabilizes the juvenile population across a very broad range of uh, spawner abundances or or abundance of egg deposition, okay? Um, I think I'll mention now that, uh, here's an example from this steelhead population from this river in Northern Vancouver Island. Uh, after our freshwater range contraction, I'll kind of allude to this later, but I'll maybe just briefly mention it now that it was an interesting thing that was detected um, uh, when uh, marine survival went down uh, while the Keo River steelhead were being monitored, and what 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 happened there was that the the, the low marine survival effectively caused um, a reduction in uh, basically the length of stream that was available for the juveniles to rear in. Uh, basically a range contraction. And that was a combination of low marine survival, the ability of the steelhead to home to quality habitats, and the, uh, the, 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 the feature in that watershed that the best quality habitats were in the middle and the lower portions of the watershed. So what marine survival, low marine survival ended up translating in, in fresh water is a, a, a reduction in the length of stream that was um, accessible to the juveniles. So uh, interesting, interesting 
relationship between marine survival and uh, and freshwater habitat occupancy. Um, I just bring it up now because I th will be returning to it a little bit later. But the, the, this is really for to point out how the freshwater habitat can be easily filled over a very broad range of spawning stock sizes, uh, to the extent that in the southern hemisphere, uh, this species is the main threat to their distant relatives in the south. Uh, this is this lineage diverged from the pikes and 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 the, and the salmonids. Uh, uh, about 100 million years ago, when the, the when they when the poles were cooling and the temperate 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 environmental conditions were developing both in the northern and southern their hemisphere, so this, these are their distant relatives in the southern hemisphere. They're really no match for these species when this species is introduced down there. Um, actually, this species is the most widely introduced species of fish in the, in the world, introduced to every continent except Antarctica, and in all, it, it always takes hold as a non anadromous population, with the exception of uh, one or two instances to date. Okay, so um, in 2018, uh, the science body that advises the federal government on, on the status of species, species at risk, that's COSIWIC, uh, conducted an emergency, emergency assessment for these two, for, well, for the steelhead and um, concluded a couple of basic things. One is that um, uh, uh, only, only Thompson and, and Chilcotin populations uh, were considered, uh, not the other ones that I mentioned before, but in just considering those, they, they, they determined that they were uh, uh, distinct enough to warrant their own, uh, their own um, designation as conservation units. So uh, they were uh, uh, distinct enough and significant enough in terms of evolutionary differences and, uh, and differences in traits and, and whatnot that they warranted their own uh, unit. So that was one thing that they concluded. The other thing they concluded is that they were both endangered. So following, following, following that, it was an, what was called an emergency assessment procedure um, and uh, and what followed was um, a procedure, um, uh, um, uh, an opera, um, a procedure uh, by DFO uh, called a recovery potential assessment, which I participated in and with a couple of colleagues. And so, in that exercise, uh, we uh, we assessed uh, uh, in um, more quantitative detail, I suppose, than uh, than the COSIWIC assessment. But we we assessed the productivity and we explored. It was an exploratory analysis. We explored what factors may have caused the decline, or uh, yeah, yeah, it was an ex ex explore, uh, ex exploration type study uh, uh, in considerable part. Um, and so in keeping with the standards of how to go about these things, because these are observational data and we have to deal with correlations in order to see how well uh, some candidate factors support the patterns that we've observed, okay? Uh, the, pa the, the, the factors that were considered and qualified were uh, these four. They were, uh, we looked at predation and this is predation in the ocean. We looked at ocean conditions and that included inshore conditions and offshore conditions. Uh, we looked at um, competition, uh, and that's competition in the uh, marine waters, uh, competition with salmon. And then we looked at freshwater conditions as well. Uh, of these four, um, we, uh, we had some reason actually to be, uh, I would say the freshwater conditions was actually right off the bat, probably one of the, the least qualified of these to be considered because uh, we, we knew going in that we had uh, two water, two water, two watersheds or two UTUs in which the habitat, there was considerable amount of contrast between the two. And for this species at least, and even with the wildfires in the, in the, in the, in the Chilcotin Plateau, the, the habitat, the state of the habitat for this species, given that they live in a lar large river environments in the Chilcotin and Seco rivers, and that these rivers originate from large lakes, and uh, that flow out of parks, the, the, the habitat is really uh, quite pristine as far as this species is concerned. Uh, it, whereas in the Thompson, there are parts of the water, Thompson watershed that have been impacted physically uh, in a number of ways. Uh, there is 
very good habitat in the Thompson as well, but there are patches of degraded habitat. So, and 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 the, the conditions are naturally different as well. Uh, the Chilcotin has no low flow or temperature issues. So, going in, we knew that you know both 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 DUs were uh, were uh, in a comparably poor state. But going in, we knew that we had we had some suspicion already that well, freshwater conditions aren't don't appear to be. It's not obvious that you know they're as strong potentially a stronger candidate as some of these others. But we included it anyway uh, because it's you know well, it's important to include it. Let's say I'll leave it at that. Uh, so look, the correlate what what we have to consider here when we're looking at these kind of statistical relationships is that you know we're looking for correlations that are high that are found consistently across multiple situations that that there are no completing competing explanations and that uh, and that the correlations consistent with mechanistic explanations that can be supported by environmental evidence so these are the standards by which we went about this exploratory analysis so um, the first thing we considered is we considered how the productivity for the two uh, for the two DUs uh, has trended over time. Uh, this is the same as what I showed earlier. This is a, this is the number of offspring that a female will produce uh, had, had, if she was the only one in the population. So the maximum number of offspring once you factor density out, and you can see that in the Thompson back uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, each female would have produced uh, in optimum conditions anywhere from eight to 14 to 10 adult returns for 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 each of her and the males that would have spawned with her male or males would have spawned with her and that how that how that has declined to uh to her just being uh replaced and and actually even less like below one well returning less than one fish and and not quite replacing her uh in the Chilcotin, it starts a little earlier, and then there's this period of increase, but then a period of general decline, and uh, some some a short short reprieve here. This uh, this period of high productivity, um, th this is signaled here, but it's not shown very well in the Thompson. But uh, w this occurred throughout the North American range of steelhead, basically. That in the mid '80s was uh, it. It's known broadly throughout the range as a period when uh, conditions were exceptionally good for production of steelhead. But, uh, but we started with this measure with our exploratory analysis. And then we looked at how well it correlated with our candidate factors. And uh, for the Thompson, this is what this this was the result. Uh, this is this is some of the results from the uh, recovery potential assessment work that was done. So the way the uh, various factors uh, ranked in order uh, is that there was a strong association, statistical association between productivity and predation, followed by uh, competition, followed by ocean conditions, and then followed by freshwater conditions. Uh, there's a strong association uh, with predation and, almost, and practically no association with freshwater conditions. Um, the actual variables that represent these uh, these hypothetical factors are uh, were are uh, total seal abundance or just harbor seal abundance for predation. Competition was total salmon abundance in the North Pacific, and uh, this is actually the sum of pink chum and sockeye, which constitute basically the total. Uh, adding chinook, steelhead, and cherry salmon the, uh, doesn't doesn't really make a difference. The total is practically just those three species, and that's what it, that's what this total abundance means. It's total pink chum and, and sockeye. Uh, for offshore, uh, for ocean conditions, this is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and this is basically an offshore temperature index. Uh, uh, temperature index in the North Pacific above 20 degrees north latitude. Okay. Uh, maximum weight is uh, the data that I showed earlier, the maximum weight trend of steelhead. And it could be classified under ocean conditions, but it's really the combination of ocean conditions and competition. You can classify it both ways. Sea surface temperature, that's inshore, that's in the Strait of Georgia. And those, so, so the, for competition ocean conditions, those, those are the four variables that were examined. And for fresh water conditions, we looked at summer low flow and winter maximum flow. 
Okay, but the important point here is that this was the rank order of the uh, of the various factors as they related to productivity, with predation being strongly correlated and freshwater conditions not being correlated at all. Uh, for the Chilcotin, uh, basically the same result: uh, predation ranking uh, highest, and freshwater conditions basically no association with the productivity trend at all. Um, competition ranked higher than ocean conditions alone. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, consistency between the two. Um, and, but during the peer review process, uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, it was acknowledged, agreed upon that uh, these when we when we when we estimate these points, what we end up doing is we end up taking away some of the short term variation in uh, productivity over time. In the process of standardizing it as if there was only one female every year and seeing and estimating how many off adult offspring she would have produced in those maximum uh, sort of conditions uh, of low competition. Uh, there, the, the process of, uh, of estimating these points takes away uh, some of the short-term variability. So the concern was that maybe we weren't we weren't representing an association with freshwater factors uh, accurately. That we were biasing uh, biasing freshwater factors as a possible factor. We we're biasing them low. So uh, we 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 took another uh, we we included a second approach where basically we um, we go back in time. And we predict all of the uh, successive observations of, of how many returns are produced, given how many spawners there are. And then uh, we compare that to uh, other predictive models that include each one, a uh, separate model for each one of these factors. And, and we, include, we include these variables to help with the prediction it would adjust the prediction and the better the adjustment the better the better the better association between what we would have predicted and what we would have observed so when we did this for the thompson we ended up with the same rank order of hypotheses the best uh, the best models were the predation models and uh, the worst models were the freshwater condition models so this approach where we retained more of the short term variability in in the productivity pattern didn't help this score on the far right is a scoring system for when we compare each one of these models to each other. And you can see that the model that has no extra variable, just, just a straight statistical predictive model predicting how many adult offsprings are produced from a spawning stock, that these, these these scores, which are pretty much all equal, base, basically say that uh, your predictive ability does not improve by including these freshwater factors. The, the size of these scores is actually allows us to say, allows us to phrase the results in a particular way. So what we would say with these results, we would say that uh, these low scores here indicate strong support uh, strong strong support for these hypothetical factors that the data have strong support for this these hypothetical factors and no support for these and the uh the beyond uh, uh below below these predation models the all these would be we would describe these as weak we wouldn't even describe these as modest for the for this model for a model to be modest we would be looking for a score of say between two and seven and so this these all exceed seven so we would say predation uh, predation was strong predation hypotheses were strongly supported the rest were weak but the strongest of the weak were competition ocean conditions and freshwater conditions and for the Chilcotin, uh, same thing, uh, basically same thing. The predation models uh, were strongly supported. Uh, models that included freshwater variables uh, did not improve the predictive ability at all. And uh, uh, the rest were all classified as weak, uh, as weak factors, but the strongest of the weak were, again, competition followed by either competition or ocean condition factors here, okay? 
so uh, uh, just recently in 2020, uh, uh, researchers in Washington, uh, Washington State, uh, conducted a similar similar type of exploratory analysis for Puget Sound steelhead. Um, there, uh, uh, they were they weren't using um, total survival or uh, total total production of offspring given how many spawners they didn't span the entire life history life history they they looked at uh particular uh, they looked at how many how many uh adult offspring returned relative to how many smolts went into puget sound so basically smolt survival and they uh have since found uh the same uh uh they they, they have the same results that we have in our rpa which is that seal abundance was the strongest predictor showing a strong negative relationship with steelhead marine survival uh, indicating that predation pressure may influence marine survival. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, another study that uh, just uh, not too long ago from 2017 that's also consistent here uh, is that um, there is um, a spatial synchrony in smolt survival across the landscape. So basically what that means is that uh, watersheds that drain uh, into the ocean close to one another on the scale of a uh, low, like two or 300 kilometers, show very similar smolt survival patterns. And um, uh, closer, closer smolt survival patterns than those, those that are located far apart. Um, and in this study, so uh, what that suggests is that there's some important processes going on either early in the marine life or close to the inshore areas, okay? Um, and uh, another, another, another result from this study and combining it with um, how, how, uh, how, how steelhead survival has trended even beyond this study. This study included uh, Lower Columbia River, it included uh, Western Washington, uh, Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, uh, and included uh, one, uh, the Keogh River uh, in, in uh, the east coast of Vancouver Island, northern Vancouver Island. And uh, what they found was that in the area that they studied that uh, the smolt survival patterns broke down into four groups. The, 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 the biggest decline happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the watersheds that drained into the inland seas, so Puget Sound, and including Cleo River that, uh, that, that, uh, that are more inland. Uh, other areas did, did not show a decline. So Juan de Fuca, that's, it, although it's in the strait, it's actually quite open and it's outside of some of the narrow passageways to get out into the open sea, uh, no decline. Western Washington, no decline. And we know from other studies that uh, Western Oregon, no decline. And we know from our monitoring in BC that by the time you get to mid coast, uh, central coast BC, north of Vancouver Island, and if you go to, and into the Skeena and into the NAS, uh, there's no evidence of survival decline, uh, at least not yet up there. Okay, so this, the, 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 the spatial pattern of, of, of smolt decline is in these inland seas. Okay. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of extra information about predation since it ranked the highest. This is how the um, seal abundance in the Strait of Georgia has uh, uh, trended since uh, over the duration of the steelhead time series that I was just showing you. So this is of course a result of marine mammal protection, uh, both um, in the United States and in Canada. Uh, uh, the blue is the harbor seals uh, increasing in abundance over the time frame. Uh, the red are the California sea lions and the green are the stellar sea lions. And the, there's actually some elephant sea lions as well, but it's a minor component. The harbor seals we know predate on um, salmon smolts and salmon adults. And, uh, uh, they, they predate on both, uh, whereas we know the sea lions don't predate on the smolts, but they do predate on the adults. Um, in the springtime, when, the, uh, when a lot of the salmon smolts and steelhead smolts uh, are 
going to see the sea lions are on the a lot of the sea lions are on the rookeries so they're not in, they're not in the strait of georgia they're not in puget sound they're uh, a lot of them are on in the north part of vancouver island they're on the breeding rookeries they're just not present uh, they do come in in the winter time but then by the springtime they're gone so the sea lions are not smoke predators but uh, harbor seals definitely are and all of them are uh, adult salmon predators uh, this is just a personal observation and experience that I had uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is the this is the Albion test fishery, and uh, uh, I, the, these are the, the last two steelhead that I ever observed on that test fishery. And the interesting observation here was that um, the commercial fishermen were, were explaining to me about how how species selective uh, the seals can be, uh, at least when they're working a gillnet. So uh, the, the experience here was that uh, we were catching mainly chum salmon because I was on the chum salmon test fishery at the time. And these were the only two steelhead uh, that we observed. And when we pulled them over the, the, the we brought them in over the stern, uh, they, were both, they, were both, they were both dead because the seals had killed them in the net. And they say that this is very common and uh, that, the, that, that they can be very, very high, highly selective, at least with respect to species uh, goes. Uh, Seals, seals can combine very nicely with uh, fishing and they can combine very nicely with hydroelectric dams and so can sea lions as we uh, as, has been the experience in the Columbia and even with hatcheries. So uh, whenever protein is concentrated uh, in a human induced way, these smart marine mammals will, you know, eventually they'll respond and uh, they certainly have become increasingly um, uh, problematic, let's say, for a lot of a lot of the lot of our test fisheries, and certainly more pre uh, uh, more present than they've ever been. But uh, and in, uh, just a personal observation here that of how of how selective they can be. So in the mid two thousands here, in these years here. Um, it was a sequence of years where at a few locations, uh, a couple of locations in the interior Fraser and one location uh, 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 in the Squamish watershed draining into House Sound in the Chequemus River, where we were tagging steelhead smolts um, and, and tracking them downriver and into the ocean and uh, beyond and, and then and tracking them right to when they exited the all the inshore areas. And uh, this 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 just lists how many smolts we detected okay well the lo locations were the cold water river which is in the thompson watershed and the chequemus is uh, uh, is tributary to the squamish so these uh, uh and then the cold water here uh the deadman i mean is also from the thompson watershed and uh, uh and then a few more years where where we were, were doing undertaking these uh these tagging studies and overall we noticed that um, that in a one to four week period which is the time it takes for these steelhead to uh, once they enter the Strait of Georgia to actually leave not only the Strait of Georgia but also Wanda either Wanda Fuca or Johnson Strait and like and, and travel beyond Queen Charlotte Sound, if, depending on which route they take, they can take one of two routes. So if they take, if they, if they let's say they enter at the Fraser and they go through one of Fuca, it's a little more, the, the transit time's about eight days, eight and a half days, so a little better than a week. And if they transit through Johnson Straits, it's about four weeks. So let's say one to four weeks, um, that uh, the mortality rate estimated was uh, almost 70%. Now this is, uh, when, when, when we infer what the mortality rate is from when they leave the inshore waters after we finish tracking them to when they return and, and, and return to the rivers and migrate through the inshore water against, uh, waters again and actually get detected in the rivers where it's, it's the first opportunity to detect how many there are coming back after, after, going, after, after dealing with whatever it is they're encountering in the inshore marine waters, whether it's commercial fisheries or more predation, okay? This level of mortality in this one to four week period is roughly equal to the mortality that is implied uh, by, uh, by, by when they come back. In other words, this is very intense. This is a very intense uh, period of mortality in the life history of these fish. 
in Puget Sound, where they conducted similar studies, uh, their fish took two to three weeks to go through Puget Sound, uh, comparable to R1 to 4. Most of their fish will go through Juan de Fuca Strait, uh, which is probably accounts for in there not being a, a very, uh, you know, not, this not being uh, four, maybe even five, uh, the higher number. But they detected about 80% mortality, a little higher than what we detected in, in their part of the inland sea. So a few years afterwards, um, uh, data were being collected on the um, diet composition um, of harbor seals with uh, the collection of scats and the, uh, the uh, analysis of the scat composition. And uh, the researchers uh, working on this, uh, they published in 2017. And uh, um, it, when we when when we we noticed in their paper that um, in the springtime they had detected steelhead being consumed, and in May of one of their years, the the consumption of uh, like base, first of all, the consumption of smolts by harbor seals always constitutes a minor component of their diet. They most they mainly eat herring or hake, depending on whether it's summer or winter. Okay, but there was a minor component of salmon, and, uh, and as it turns out, not an insignificant one. Once you figure out what how many total salmon are consumed, but in what what caught our attention at the time was that in the month of May. Uh, half of all the salmon that were detected, uh, half of all the salmon that were consumed were steelhead in the one year. Uh, so that caught our attention. And so we followed up and we asked, uh, we asked if they could provide us with a total consumption estimate. And uh, they provided us with an estimate of about 360,000 smolts per year consumed in the Strait of Georgia, uh, Johnson Strait and Juan de Fuca. So, uh, uh, we didn't know how to interpret this. Uh, we hadn't tried estimating, or at least I wasn't familiar with any estimates of, well, how many smolts could possibly be going into those waters uh, by which we might compare what this consumption estimate. So we did that, and this was the result. We took a couple of approaches to estimating what the, smolt, the wild smolt input was, and we got some consistent answers. Um, which bolstered our confidence a little bit, but at any rate, this is what we dis well, this is what we determined that that there were 100 to 150 thousand or so in those years when we had a 360 consumption estimate, which is lower, which is less than the consumption estimate. So when we when this was the first step we took, and we thought, oh my goodness, you know, this is not this is not gonna it's not gonna make any sense. But then uh, we eventually got to the point where we added uh, how many uh, smolts were being stocked. And uh, I was personally a little bit surprised at how big a component that uh, additional input was just from about uh, less than, uh, oh no, about, let's see, it was about 11 or 12 uh, stock st uh, streams that were being stocked, okay. So uh, once we completed the estimates and uh, it allowed us to compare what the consumption estimate was with what we what we roughly thought was going in and it was just interesting to note that it was an it was a percentage that was similar to what our tag loss rates in in the various uh tag loss studies okay so um uh, 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 the, the, the strongest of those models that were classified as weak was of course uh, the offshore competition followed by ocean conditions um, so uh, when steelhead go to sea, uh, they are um, relative to all the other salmon species. They, they, they feed relatively high in the water column, uh, which explains their uh, strong counter shading, their dark backs and their white, white undersides. Um, they, uh, and they, and the, the important part of their offshore diet consists of squid. Uh, and it also consists of, um, uh, 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 fishes like lantern fishes and uh, and uh, pelagic fishes. Okay, they'll feed on a, a, a um, they'll feed on uh, they'll feed on a variety of stuff, but that those those are important components. Um, let's see, they they I just want to list this for you. Here's a list of what they eat, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, 
uh, these 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 uh, pelagic or gonadid, as they're called, gonadid squids and lanternfish and epipelagic juvenile fishes. Those things are really important, but uh, they'll they'll of course eat krill, pelagic pelagic free swimming snails and sea slugs and also uh, bristle worms. And it's in, it struck me interesting that. Uh, Basically, their dye composition in the ocean is exactly the same uh, in terms of composition as it would be in fresh water, except the freshwater form of these creatures, you know, whether they're snails or, or, uh, or, uh, or crustaceans or fishes or, or, or worms or things of that nature. It's a, the, same, the same kinds of critters, just the freshwater form, except for squid. Uh, squid don't live in fresh water. So, uh, and it is a uh, important, important part of, of their diet, but, but not only their diet, uh, the diet of pretty much every other species out there. So uh, here is sockeye on the top, chum, pink, coho, chinook, and steelhead. And you see that the bars with the diagonal lines through them, hash marks, uh, are that's the squid composition. And so here's the steelhead eating squid. And there's lots of squid. Uh, one year where squid was a minor component, but and the black is the fish. But you can see chinook like to eat squid. So do coho. So do pink. Chum not so much. Uh, and definitely sockeye. Okay, so they definitely eat each other's food uh, when out at sea, and even steelhead's most important food to steelhead, and probably more important to chinook by the looks of things. But um, and uh, so here, here are a couple of the measures that we used in the exploratory analysis. Okay, and the the orange plot. Uh, is the relative abundance of salmon in the North Pacific. And so in, in the last few years, it's, it's, it's peaking or it's, it's stabilizing at a very, very high level. Okay, but it's higher than we've ever reserved it before. Okay. The PDO is, uh, is, uh, is an index that in the past has been strongly associated with spatial patterns of salmon production along the North American coast. That when it's high, uh, productivity and abundance is high in the northern part of the range, like in Western Alaska and, and uh, up in Alaska generally. And then when it's low, uh, it, that's a time when the ocean is favorable for high production and abundance, higher production and abundance in the southern, more southern parts of the range, like the Pacific Northwest or Southern BC. So the, the point that I, 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 I illustrate here is that uh, for the first time, we actually have a combination of really high salmon abundance and unfavorable. This would be unfavorable unfav for Alaska, but unfavorable for Southern BC and uh, Pacific Northwest. So this comp, this combination has now developed, and this gray plot is just the productivity of Thompson, uh, just to give you a bit of a comparison. But the, the idea that let's say even with the decline in body mass of, of steelhead over time and it, it, this this idea that it's not just ocean conditions or it's it's not just it's not just total salmon density out there and competition it's like how the two are how the two factors are interacting and in 2020 here just recently this was uh, illustrated nicely uh, as evidence for um, uh, 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 production and abundance patterns of sockeye, where uh, in the northern part of the range, uh, the increase in abundance and productivity by the favorable ocean condition was was reduced somewhat by the high competition, and in the south, uh, both both were acting as negative influences on sockeye production. So this paper in 2020. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, describe this nicely f from the sockeye perspective. Here are the actual, uh, at least for the recent decades at least, what the estimates of biomass of salmon is in the North Pacific for the three species that constitute the almost the entire amount. Um, you wouldn't really see the other species if we stack those, uh, they would be very, very small additions to the bars here. But, uh, uh, this is the uh, total biomass of adult and immature biomass in the North Pacific published in 2018. Uh, at the same time we were doing the uh, recovery potential assessment. So we used those data right away. Uh, timing was good for the, that publication uh, for us. 
And uh, so in terms of biomass, 40% of the current biomass originates from hatcheries now. And uh, you can see a lot of it is in the green, which are the chum salmon. Pinks are in pink, sockeye are in red, and the green are the, are the chums. So a lot of the biomass is, 40% uh, of the biomass is originating from hatcheries. A lot of it is in the form of chum production. And the big chum producers are Japan and Alaska. In terms of number, this is what the plot looks like. Uh, in terms of number of fish, it's mostly pinks. And in terms of the total number of salmon returning now, 25% of the returning adults originate from hatcheries is, is, is what is estimated here. Okay. And across all species, pretty much, just like in steelhead, we see uh, the body, body size decline, uh, declining body size trends um, for chum, for pink. Uh, not so much for sockeye, but this is sockeye basin wide. And uh, one of the uh, authors of this paper in a previous, uh, Brendan Connors, uh, who's at DFO, published a paper earlier showing that, well, at least along BC, there's decline in sockeye size. So it might not be so apparent uh, across the entire North Pacific, but in BC, we're definitely seeing decline in body size of sockeye. Okay, a little bit about freshwater conditions. Um, I just wanna show you the data that were used in that exploratory analysis when it comes to freshwater conditions. Uh, you know, you can probably remember that, you know, the productivity and abundance trends for steelhead just basically go down pretty steadily, more or less. Uh, this is what the summer low flow, uh, measure of summer low flow looks like for the Thompson. And you can see that uh, there might be a small trend, but it's really not, uh, it's not really self-evident that there's a trend. Uh, those of us that have worked in the watershed for many years, uh, we know full well that the worst drought years were in the mid 80s. They are not recent. Uh, we had uh, more severe drought conditions back in the day. And uh, this plot basically uh, is consistent with that. Um, you'll see the scale here for the Thompson at 0.3. These measures are relative to the average annual discharge. And this is, and these are measures just in the steelhead bearing waters of, of these watersheds, just those. So, uh, you know, there is, Thompson does have low flow uh, naturally, uh, but Del Chilcotin doesn't. Well, you can see the, the, it, the, 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 the minimum 30 day average discharge during the summer in the Chilcotin is almost the average. So it's completely different with respect to flows, um, just different hydrology. Uh, here is the high winter flow. These are the plots, and uh, you know there's we've had we've had less severe high winter flows lately in the Thompson, uh, even as far as minimum goes. Uh, and just there's nothing there's nothing that's obvious here about any kind of correspondence with uh, the productivity trends that we've observed. So. Uh, Sort of another sort of another perspective on um, on freshwater habitat. Uh, uh, freshwater space is, is commonly limited for the species. Okay, they fill it up quite easily because they do spend a long, relatively long time in freshwater before they become smolts. Uh, longer than uh, longer than stream type chinooks, longer than coho, longer than sockeye. Uh, sockeye rearing in lakes, obviously. Uh, pretty much, uh, mostly, um, but, uh, but th these data, these data were collected in the Thompson watershed. And the reason we were collecting these data originally, and we started around 1999, was uh, we were going to estimate uh, con abundances for conservation uh, reference points. We were gonna estimate for management purposes, you know, what the conservation abundances would be. And we were going to do this by relating how, uh, well, ideally we wanted to relate how smolt abundance related to the abundance of spawners that, uh, but we had to, we had to work with the par population because as I explained earlier, uh, no one, no one, no one has even attempted to uh, do a smolt trapping project in the Thompson watershed. Uh, but we did have a way of uh, doing, uh, producing very good estimates of the of the one and a half year old juvenile population, most of which would have smolted just five months after we would have counted them, uh, and some of which would have smolted a year and a half afterwards. But 
what what happened was that when we started the project, we uh, we had good evidence that the majority of these juveniles would have come from steelhead, would have been produced from steelhead. But as we worked through the decade and beyond the decade, uh, abundance of steelhead went down. And at one point, uh, it would we could it would the the assumption that the majority of these were coming from steelhead. Uh, we were no longer confident that that was true, so we did another study to exactly to examine exactly what was going on uh, in terms of the composition of uh, who was who was producing these juveniles, whether it was the steelhead mo steelhead mothers or the resident mothers. So in, in 2006, we had a fairly uh, uh, in 2006 we were sampling a juvenile population that came from. Uh, fish that were born in 2005. And in 2005, we had about uh, over 2,400 Thompson River steelhead spawners, which is a fairly good number. Um, and, and, and what we found was that uh, it's just uh, the, the, uh, the relative abundance of the juveniles is just represented by the blue bars. And basically, we found that about 80% of the juvenile population came from the steelhead mothers, and about 20% came from the rainbow mothers. A few years later, when we had about a quarter of the number of steelhead spawners, it turned out that about half of the juveniles came from steelhead mothers and half uh, came from rainbow mothers. So that really compromised our original objective of characterizing what conservation abundances sh should be for steelhead. And we eventually had to estimate those values using other data uh, basically other data, uh, but we eventually did come up with them. And there's a, non, a number of conservation reference points that uh, have been reported on and been reviewed now. So, uh, so but it, as circumstances were, uh, the, the, this pattern, this trend, this change that occurred while we were attempting to do this uh, basically compromised uh, us achieving the object, the original objective, at least anyway. What we also did following this is we eventually collected uh, some steelhead uh, uh, after they had spawned and were either dead or close to dying. And some resident, uh, uh, mature resident uh, samples as well. And what we found was that uh, of the steelhead, uh, of the steelhead that we collected, uh, over a fairly short time period, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, from in 2014 and 2015, okay, when when steelhead abundances were, uh, uh, when steelhead abundances, the generation prior uh, that would have given rise to these, so these were sampled in 14 and 15, so the product, these would have come from spawners in 09, 010, and in 2009, 2010, there were just under 700 spawners in the watershed. So that's a relatively low number. So when steelhead uh, spawners were low, and we checked how 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 many uh, uh, what proportion of their offspring actually came from steelhead mothers, we noticed that about half of the steelhead females came from well, about 43.43 43 percent came from steelhead mothers, 53 percent came from resident mothers, and of the steelhead males. Uh, roughly 50-50, 55 and 45 from steelhead mothers and re resident mothers respectively, okay? So sizable components of the steelhead were being produced by the residents. Also, a sizable component of the resident males were being produced by the steelhead, which is, which is not surprising uh, because to those that work on this species because um, Sneak spawning is a common characteristic of all salmonids, pretty much, many of them at least anyways. And in this species, it manifests itself mostly not by the production of jacks, as you would have, say, for Chinook or Coho or Sockeye, where they go to sea and come back early. This, this steelhead only, mostly manifests itself by the production of male residents. So uh, steelhead, it's no surprise a steelhead female would produce uh, male residents because they 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 will they will they will be they will be able to either be dominant or sneak spawners uh, with resident females or with steelhead females because by by virtue of sneaking. But what we what we also notice is that 
basically steelhead mothers don't produce resident daughters and that resident mothers by and large produce resident daughters and this result is was consistent with some other studies that were being published at about the same time that we were that we were that we were doing this uh basically when crossbreeding occurs steelhead females will in turn produce uh, the progeny of both sexes uh they will produce male offspring that will remain resident but they will tend not to produce resident female offspring so these were some studies that were done in the united states and basically uh, showed this consistent pattern so uh, there's been numerous genetic studies since and uh to the extent that uh and the genes required for anatomy are now known and uh, they are they are concentrated, uh, they're particularly concentrated on one particular chromosome near where the clock genes are located. And clock genes are those genes that are, um, that are involved in expressing traits that require a particular timing. Okay, so no surprise that something that is, genes that are associated with anadromy would be located around genes uh, where the clock genes are located, and that happens to be the case. There are some genes elsewhere in other chromosomes uh, that, are, uh, that are associated with anadromy, but there's a, uh, there's a concentration on them, of them in one, in one chromosome. So anadromy is definitely inherited. Uh, anadromous parents, uh, uh, to pass on, ten, have a, uh, pass on the tendency for their life history to their offspring, and um, um, uh, f uh, and then uh, it, it's also been shown in uh, Chinook salmon at least that the the fathers will def will have will pass on will the sons will inherit the life history of the father. There's a tendency for that as well. Okay, uh, but it's not. Uh, oh, and uh, before we get to the influence of environment, here is a. Uh, here are some results from the Columbia River that shows this in another way. So uh, this is a, 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 an experiment that was done in the Columbia River where uh, uh, residents and anadromous monitors brought into the hatchery. Uh, they were they were uh, 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 they were bred they were bred uh, they were crossed in a variety of ways. The offspring were tagged and then they were detected very low down in the Columbia River watershed. Uh, for those that are familiar, down uh, at the Bonneville Dam. And so when they cross steelhead females with steelhead males, they, ha they, ha they, they got a certain, like, a certain percentage were detected, about 50% were detected at Bonneville. But when they crossed uh, resident males with steelhead females, uh, the, the percent that were detected was much lower, about half. This is very common in nature because this, is, this would represent, say, the sneak spawning uh, strategy that can occur uh, in nature, which is very common. Uh, this is uncommon in nature because this is the this would be a combination of uh, resident female spawning with a steelhead male, and uh, in especially in our interior populations, the, the, the steelhead steelhead males on average will not find difficulty finding uh, steelhead females because the sex ratios are about. They, in, in the Thompson watershed, they average about between sixty and seventy percent. Uh, the spawning population is female. Um, so, uh, and because of their behavioral ecology, this 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 combination in nature is much less common than this, or almost. But when the, we do cross them, we just we get a similar reduction in uh, the percent detected downstream that decide to smolt or you know, that, that, that undertake the, the anatomist life history. And when they crossed uh, resident females with rainbow males, uh, they still produce some smolts, but just at a much lower, just at a, at a much lower rate compared to the pure crosses, okay? But there is an environmental effect on the influence of, of, of the expression of uh, the anatomist life history. And uh, the way this manifests itself is that it, it depends on the sex of the individual fish. Um, basically, the way it works is that when uh, a juvenile steelhead, say, let's say a juvenile male steelhead is about, um, is about eight months of age, if it happens to be, if it happens to have put on more than average amount of fat, say, or a good good amount of fat, that will that will uh, that will that will potentially cause it to uh, uh, cause it to not follow through on its inherited proclivity to go to sea. 
okay? If, if they're growing well, if they're, if they're accumulating fat as early, uh, at, by at least by eight months of age, then, then those, uh, the genes for anatomy will, uh, won't, be, won't be expressed. They'll adopt the resident life history and they just don't go to sea. It can also happen in females, but it requires them, uh, they have to be much fatter. It's the threshold is much higher. Um, and, and that, and the way that works, um, it has interesting, has interesting sort of implications as to what you might do in fresh water. Like it's not, it's not that simple that, you know, you make, these are, it's not that simple that you just make life as comfortable as possible for them in, uh, in fresh water, you know, for good in, for good conservation intentions, say. Uh, give them lots of space, give them cool temperatures. These are cold-blooded animals. Uh, cooler temperatures, like say uh, near their optimum, uh, in the mid-teens say, uh, that, that will allow them to put on body fat. And so uh, if you want to, if you want, if you want to maximize their proclivity to go to sea and avoid the triggers the, that the environment can can trigger, you basically don't want to be producing fat offspring. Uh, you you want to be producing lean offspring. Uh, ultimately, smolting is a feeding migration, and its 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 expression is enhanced by some degree of uh, leanness, or maybe even uh, so far as to say as starvation, uh, or or just lack of fatness say and uh and uh and and that and that is actually and that is actually apparent when we look um at how residents and and anatomous fish are distributed across the landscape in a watershed like the nicola watershed where we have a good diversity of of uh of stream types to look at and basically the stronghold of steelhead in the nicola watershed is uh the the montane streams and rivers that come off of the north face of the face of the cascade that would be like the cold water and spice creeks for those who are familiar those have hydrologies that are highly variable high spring flows very low summer flows and warm temperatures and as long as the flows don't get so low that you get stagnation in the oxygenation uh, you know keeping the temperatures warmer will help them keep them uh, uh, that will avoid the accumulation of the fat, and you know a good amount of competition probably doesn't help, uh, doesn't hurt either. But we see that that that's the, the these montane streams with their variable hydrology in these uh, and their naturally low flows is where the steelhead dominate. And in parts of the watershed that are lake headed, where the hydrograph is much more moderated, the flows don't get as low. Um, those are the places where the residents dominate uh, the stream. So we even see that in the landscape. So it's not, it's not all that simple about what you might do in freshwater to the extent that you're willing to do it, as to you know whether whether you would exacerbate or diminish uh, these environmental triggers or not. Okay, so there's a there's a considerable amount of complexity here, and uh, when considering you know what what might what what might one do you know where where might one focus most if uh, if we're concerned with recovering uh, the anadromous population uh, it helps it helps to kind of keep um, when you have the, this dynamic between the two life history types it helps to uh, set up a little bit of a simulation to keep track of of all that's going on and uh, for this for a simu for for a for a simulation of with this amount of complexity, we actually have enough data to basically inform all of the survival steps in these two, uh, 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 the way it's laid out here. And you know, we uh, we include uh, the the limited freshwater habitat. You know, we include that and the various survival steps, and we set it up given you know the recent abundances and and how uh, and how uh, and um, and how. Uh, offspring have been produced have, at the rate at which offspring have been produced. We include variables for that, given who the mothers were. So, you, you basically, structuring it uh, according to the data that we have available, 
okay? And then there are some parameters along here that you could say represent certain levers, and then we could examine, okay, well, let's say we tried to pull some levers and see, you know, what the outcome is. Um, so this just helps keeping the, it's just, it's just a way of helping to keep the thinking uh, straight uh, when considering, uh, considering, you know, what effect certain levers might have. So if we set something like this up, and uh, let's say we, uh, uh, we identify some parameters that are associated with certain levers, and here, uh, 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 predation inshore, or uh, here's a lever, freshwater range expansion, say, or steelhead fishing mortality is a lever. Uh, freshwater habitat improvement, and uh, we even included here a lever of, uh, of varying the rainbow trout mortality because there's, there's a connection between the two life histories. So in this exercise here, we just tweak these each of these each of these levers just by you know just by uh, a nominal amount, just by 10%, just uh, equal relative amount, just to see what happens. And what we're watching is the change in the steelhead abundance that 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 would occur. And we're not we're not looking to make precise estimates here. We're just looking we're just looking for we're basically well. For for first off, we're just looking for sensitivity here. Uh, just got ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, we're just looking for sensitivity here. So when we when we when we when we when we give this lever about a ten percent positive tweak, we get a certain change in the pre fishery and the spawner abundance according to the simulation. When we give freshwater range expansion about a 10% increase, uh, we see uh, a double digit percentage, not as strong, but you know, uh, at least the same uh, magnitude at least. Steelhead fishing mortality, this is all set up uh, for, uh, for a, a simulation as if like in recent times. So this is, this is a scenario where uh, sur uh, survival is quite low, okay? So when survival is low and we're tweaking steelhead fishing mortality, we don't get too much of a response. We get a more of a response in spawner abundance, but uh, less of a response in pre-fishery abundance, which makes sense because we're talking about fishing and there should be a difference between pre-fishing and post-fishing abundance, okay? Uh, we're, inc we're increasing all these, so it causes a negative effect, but the negative is not an issue. Just imagine the negative's not there. It's just the absolute value that counts. So if we're looking at change in spawner abundance, steelhead fishing mortality would rank after freshwater range expansion. After that comes freshwater habitat improvement. And lastly comes rainbow fishing mortality. But these aren't, these aren't realistic scenarios. Uh, these are just looking at sensitivities. If we, okay, before we look at scenarios that are a little more realistic, um, I just want to say something about range expansion. Um, steelhead, uh, the range of steelhead in, in the degree to which steelhead range penetrates into the Fraser River watershed is uh, is uh, is among the least compared to the other salmon species, uh, uh, and I'm not talking about pinks or chums. I'm talking about the other uh, interior species. So uh, the range of sockeye is much bigger. The range of chinook is much bigger, and even the range of coho is bigger. The range of steelhead is the smallest in comparison to all of those. Eventually, the anadromous life history. Um, uh, gives way, the further inland you go, eventually the, the strategy to go to sea gives way to other living strategies for the species. So if you go up the Fraser, and if you go uh, basically upstream of Quenelle, uh, then, then going to sea is, it's, it's self-evident that it's not a viable strategy. We don't have any uh, consistent presence of spawners uh, uh, basically north of the confluence of the Chilcotin, but uh, in the 90s, we did detect steelhead uh, 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 quite unexpectedly, actually, going into the Quinell River watershed and going exactly as to where you would predict they would go, which would be the Caribou River downstream of Car uh, where the confluence is downstream of Caribou La uh, of uh, Quinell Lake. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, we don't know, we don't know the consistency uh, uh, of occupancy uh, uh, in Caribou River, it may be well be intermittent. Uh, uh, so that it's defining the length, the 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 extent of range. Um, range, and, and but it eventually peters out if you go into the watershed. But it peters out abruptly when you get to a large lake. 
uh, and that's where we see uh, the, the smaller range of steelhead in comparison to those species. We, we really see the range uh, abruptly stop at large lakes. And that's because uh, there is an alternative strategy in large lakes where the species doesn't have to go all the way to sea to, get, to gain a fecundity advantage and uh, establish itself as the most advantageous strategy. So just upstream of the Thompson, this is the Thompson, these are Thompson River steelhead. And just upstream is Kamloops Lake. And these are the rainbow trout that live in Kamloops Lake. And they don't have to get as big as steelhead, but this is the, the big bodied life history that dominates in a lake. And we have many of these, I, I think we have more, BC has more of these kinds of rainbow populations than anywhere else. And that's because, well, we the Fraser watershed is in our within our borders, and the Fraser watershed is is its characteristic is that it has many large lakes. So it has we have we have the most uh, large-bodied rainbow trout populations than anywhere else, and and these populations are associated with sockeye. They have a close ecological association with sockeye, and they occur in Shushuap Lake and Kamloops Lake and Quinell Lake, and uh, um, not in as pure a form in, in uh, Chilco Lake. Uh, they're more of an optimistic type eco feeding ecology there. But uh, Kootenai Lake is an example uh, of this form of rainbow trout, even though anadromous fish aren't in Kootenai Lake, but uh, anyway, and in Kootenai Lake, there is an association with sockeye, but just not an Adama sockeye with uh, kokanee. So uh, the, 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 point, the point here about this range expansion is that we basically, range expansion is, while it seems to be uh, a sensitive lever, isn't as good, um, isn't as good an option during times of low marine survival. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the experience that we had in the Keogh River, uh, uh, steelhead are relatively good homers relative to other salmon. Basically the pattern is with homing is that the further inland you migrate and the longer you live in fresh water as a juvenile, the more precise you're homing. That's the pattern across all the, uh, um, all the salmon species, including steelhead. So these, these fish are relatively good homers. And what you'd expect when marine survival goes down is that qu the quality of the freshwater habitat is going to matter. And they're going to, the, 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 spatially, the, the, uh, the spawning areas uh, uh, from which uh, uh, fish hatch and disperse and, and then disperse into the rearing habitat, those, those areas are going to be the, the areas and those fish using those areas are the ones that are going to be persisting. Um, and so uh, the option to range expand during time of low marine survival isn't a very good option because if you're range expanding for quality, well then, okay, you have to bank on uh, the idea that, okay, you've identified a place outside their range while you're in low marine survival that you've got good quality and hopefully you're right. And then if you do open it up, you have to get some of the few fish that are left there to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, so that they can focus in on it, so the offspring can focus in on it on the return. And it's just not a very practical option under low marine survival. Certainly, it's probably an enhancement option during times of modest or high survival where they can uh, colonize the area, get in there and take advantage of it and spread out a bit more. Um, and, and, and for this species, that's highly dependent on freshwater for rearing. A stream length is, uh, is, is, is the dominant variable whenever we try to do calculations like uh, how many fish should there be given the capacity of the habitat. And the, 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 the number one variable is always stream length. That's what you start with. And it's a very strong determinant of, of capacity, uh, generally speaking. So, but in low times of low marine survival, probably not that useful a lever. So let's get into some possible scenarios here. Um, it's certainly easy, it was certainly easy to double the survival from inshore predation uh, uh, because uh, prior to the 70s, that's exactly what the government of Canada did. They reduced uh, a seal and sea lion populations and this would be uh, relatively easy to achieve. And when we do that in the simulation, we see that we have a, you know, almost 500% increase. So going back to the very first slide where I was showing the trend in pre-fishery abundance going from some thousands down to now in each of the DUs, we're down to like low hundred, low, like one or like 200, say 200 fish of the Thompson and even under a hundred fish for the Chilcotin. Any claim that you've recovered those would, uh, would, 
you, you would have to impart uh, 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 an effect that, it, that would be in the hundreds of percent. So let's say a five-fold increase from now if you were to re if if we were to double the survival from uh, in the inshore waters, that uh, you know in the Thompson we'd be back up to a thousand, you know it'd be a you know people 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 might accept that as a, at least a partial recovery. Okay, the point is is that for these other scenarios we come nowhere close to that magnitude of response. So if we do reduce fishing mortality to zero, now when the marine environment appears to be pretty hostile and survival rates are super low in the marine environment, particularly, well, for sure in the near shore environment, that even if you drop fishing mortality down to zero, you're, you're, you don't have the potential to recover. Like, uh, you know, a 40% increase, uh, uh, say from 200 spawners in the, in the Thompson, uh, you're only up to 280 fish. So uh, if it's double digits or less, it, it's, it's not a recovery lever, but uh, it's important here. And this, is, and, this, and this point is probably the, our most important finding in the RPA work that we did for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is that under, under recent survivals, um, under recent survivals, managing what remains in terms of fishing mortality from about where we're at now, which uh, could easily be as high as 20%, if, we, if we're willing to manage it down to zero, that there's a very good chance that managing down to that level uh, and managing in that range and willing to manage it down to zero has the power, uh, has good possibility that it has the power to uh, curb the decline and, 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 and even cause a slight, a slight increase. It doesn't have the power to recover, uh, as uh, the, at least according to a definition that most people I think would accept. And certainly uh, that even the reference points for recovery that were developed either for DFO through the RPA or by the province through the application of its uh, steelhead conservation policies, um, uh, you wouldn't be able to recover at this time just with fishing, but you could stem the downward decline and reverse and reverse the trajectory that that's heading toward uh, zero steelhead spawners. Okay, that was our most important finding in the RPA was the process of, of, of what we thought could occur over a very fair, a fairly over a foreseeable future time frame. Uh, we 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 weren't very supportive of statements that uh, uh, that had to do with what would happen, say, many generations into the future. And we 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 thought that the most important finding was what might happen over a short future time span. Okay, and and that and that and that point of view is supported by some prior work where where. Uh, where, where we can only we can only, uh, a productivity measure today tells us pretty tells us gives us a pretty strong indication of what productivity will be one year uh, next year, and it has some information about what productivity will be uh, in two and three years in the future. But then, but then it doesn't tell you beyond that. Okay, so that's why uh, our findings were more focused on. What's, what would happen in the in the in, in these future simulations in the short foreseeable future? Uh, the third scenario here is uh, this is actually not a realistic scenario because this says that okay if we were good enough at improving uh, freshwater habitat in these modest to high gradient uh, steelhead streams where we could improve the quality so much and even with the president of a re resident offsprings in these watersheds that the prior to prior survival is a hundred percent. Okay, so this is this is not realistic, even though it's under the possible scenarios uh, part, uh, even, even though it's in the possible scenario slide, but we wanted to give it its due because, you know, there's always a strong tendency to, to, uh, to um, expect a lot from freshwater habitat uh, prescriptions. And what we find here, even with this overly optimistic scenario that there, uh, you cannot recover basically uh, by managing freshwater habitat. But at that, that being said, during times of low marine survival, high quality habitat is important. 
Okay, you just don't have the potential of imparting a recovery by working, by working um, uh, at the egg to in between the egg to smolt stage. Okay, all the potential for recovery is basically in in working on the survival from the smolt to adult stage. If we were to persecute rainbows, uh, we could see some slight positive change, but it, it would be pretty. It, it wouldn't. It doesn't have the power to uh, to to cause a many-fold increase in the current abundance. Okay. So basically, fishing mortality needs to be near zero at this time to reverse or stabilize the abundance trend. If we want steelhead uh, parents to produce steelhead offspring, okay, and so that. Uh, offspring continue to go down in some number at least and uh, confront the in marine environment the way it is now. So those successful, those those that are successful come back and can pass on whatever traits uh, they were lucky enough to have to the next generation. But uh, to to manage fishing mortality down to near the zero, to, to be near zero, um, uh, we can we can identify uh, times and places where certain types of uh, fishing uh, methods uh, uh, should not be used if the objective is to go to zero, and that's basically gill nets and persanes as it stands now. And uh, uh, the timing has to be estimated, um, which ha it has to be done carefully because the best estimate we have in timing comes from the Fraser River, which uh, is a location that comes after. Uh, some fish are removed, and the removal tends to be on the tails of the run. So for late sockeye and pink, there's removal of fish that happens on the front on, on the run. And for chums, it happens consistently. It happens cyclical, cyclically in the front and, and consistently on the back. So there's some negative bias for duration that, uh, that we have to consider. And we can avoid some of the negative bias on the front end if we just look at um, years where at least there's no uh, late run Fraser sockeye that are attracting fishing effort during the front end of the run. So basically the whole procedure has to be approached fairly carefully. The other thing that, that is going wrong now is that as the steelhead population has declined and we get a lot of zeros, like nowadays, some days we only get like four fish for the total catch. Uh, those kinds of data, you underestimate the duration of the run. So luckily we have a few years where we had high abundances where that kind of negative bias is 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 going to be minimized, we, we have to we can avoid some erosion of the front end of the run, but we have to live with some erosion of the back. But basically, what we understand about timing, if we analyze the data carefully, is that the protection window along the along any point along the migration routes is about almost uh, three months long, if you want to if you want to consider getting the fishing mortality near zero. So if you have fairly efficient gears that uh, where the release mortality isn't very high, then those are the gears in the migration routes only that you know need need to be considered for uh, of, of of being excluded in those times and places in order to get if the objective is to get the fishing mortality rate down to zero. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, in in this in this system of steelhead and uh, rainbow trout, there are a couple of uh, sort of sub life histories identified here, which is a hatchery, uh, uh, bringing some steelhead in, uh, eggs into the hatchery, stocking them as fry, or bringing them in uh, into the hatchery, stocking them as uh, one year olds and uh, at at a size that uh, they would be smolting. So. Um, at this point, what we don't have here are survival rates for these fish, for hatchery fish. But uh, we do know that hatchery smolts don't survive as well as wild smolts. And uh, there was a study done, uh, published in 2013, from the Chequemus River and the Squamish River that uh, is actually helpful. Uh, so what they did there is basically uh, they uh, tagged wild fish they, and they tagged hatchery fish with um, acoustic tags and uh, they tracked these fish down 
uh, uh, en route to the ocean and then tagged them through the ocean. And what they found was that for wild fish in, the, in, in this watershed here, that it, in the Chequemish Squamish watershed, that it, it, uh, the wild fish took a, just under a couple of days to get to the river mouth. They traveled at about 10 and a half kilometers a day, but the hatchery fish took about 20 days in excess of 20 days and migrated much more slowly. The survival of wild fish to the mouth was almost 80%, whereas the hatchery fish was almost down as low as 30%. So uh, we, can, we can try to use these, uh, uh, more, uh, if we you convert survival to mortality, we can convert these mortality rates uh, into, in these in, into what are instantaneous rates and then apply it to the duration of time that our fish take to, to, get, to, to, get, to, the, uh, to get to the ocean and to migrate through the inshore waters, which we know because we've measured directly, okay? And then the relative difference between wild and hatchery, we can apply that there just to get an idea of what it might be for an interior hatchery fish. And we'll use, I'll, I'll use a Thompson as an example here. Um, for a wild fish, uh, these fish from the Chequemus, as they got, once they got to the river and the ones that survived, uh, they took 13 days to migrate through the Strait of Georgia and their survival was 36%. Um, this is consistent with our, the prior results too, uh, uh, in the 2000s when we did all those tagging studies. Um, the hatchery fish, they, they, were, they, were, they were migrating about as fast now, at least the ones that survived all of this selection process here in the, in the river. And they were migrating uh, pretty much as fast as the wild fish, but the survival rate was still lower. Okay, but we can convert these to these mortality rates, and then if this if this relative difference actually applies to the to what we would see in the Thompson, then we could we could we can make some estimates of what we could expect for some for in the Thompson River. Um, when they published this paper, though, they were pretty explicit that you know seals were known predators. They've detected movement patterns that were consistent with seal movement patterns. Uh, they acknowledged that there were other predators as well, but uh, of of the ones that were listed, you know, the 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 pinnipeds, uh, uh, the pinniped predation was the one the one that uh, uh, you know was known to be a factor. So uh, so anyway, applying these applying these to the Thompson. Uh, this this is this is rather detailed and confusing, but basically, when we apply the mortality rates from the Chequemus to the Thompson, the the transit time is different, but that's okay. We the, that's factored in. That uh, we would expect thirty percent of the Thompson fish to uh, to survive. Uh, like this is the Deadman River, so they we would expect thirty percent, thirty six percent of them to survive, given the mortality rate estimate from from the Chequemus, we actually measured 20%, uh, but we thought this was bias low because uh, there's a possibility that we might have tagged uh, um, some fish that weren't intending to go to sea. So, but it, it is a minority, so not not too bad. Um, our, our, our Thompson fish, they take about, uh, if they go, if they enter the Georgia Strait and then go north through Georgia Strait and Wanda we measured uh, th that it takes them 31 days on average uh, directly to go through there. And if we apply the mortality rate from the Chequema study, 9% uh, would survive. If they go through Wanda Fuca, it would take them a little over a week. And then uh, we would estimate 51% survive. If we average that out, if, 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 if our Thompson fish half go through Wanda Fuca, half go through Puget Sound, which, appears to be the case a lot of the time uh, for the few times that we've looked. Uh, that, that, that's very consistent with what we've measured directly. So now the only assumption here is that, well, is the relative difference observed in Chickamas, Chickamas applicable to Thompson? Well, we have no choice but to use something. So we, we go with it. And uh, the hatchery fish, if they were stocked in the dead men, about a little under 1% would make it to the river mouth. And uh, about a little over 1% would make it through Georgia Strait and Johnson Straits, and about 30% would make it through uh, Wanda Fuca. Okay, so if we apply this to the simulation, we, we add a couple of more scenarios to our possible scenarios. Um, under times of low abundance, if we took 20 spawners, brought them into the hatchery, and stocked them as either fry or yearling, well, first of all, we will supersede the wild production just with those few spawners like there'll be 12 to 14 of those that'll be female if we stick to the natural sex ratio. And we'll supersede the, the fry or yearling population depending on what stage we stock. And if we simulate the effect that we don't get triple digit, multiple hundred percent change in, in abundance. 
And so my, my general understanding at this point is that uh, ha hatchery stocking is uh, even a lesser proposition now than it was maybe in the 80s when the marine environment was less hostile. And there were, um, we were probably, I think we were in excess of 60 or 70 hatchery streams in the mid 80s when we were at our peak. Incidentally, hatchery, hatchery production of steelhead was a compensation uh, measure originally when the federal government embarked on SEP, the Salmon Enhancement Program, was where the objective was to double the commercial harvest of salmon. The enhancement of steelhead was in part uh, rationalized by compensation for anticipated increase in competition in freshwater with salmon and increasing interception upon return. So that was the origin of the Salmon Enhancement Program, at least the steelhead component of it. And the number of hatchery steams uh, that were stocked grew in the 70s and in the 80s and peaked at over about 60 or 70, if I remember right. But then uh, as their performance was much less than expected, programs uh, were discontinued. And uh, there was a short period of stability recently, but uh, more and more hatchery programs are being discontinued lately because there's just no fish coming back in some instances. Even our bigger hatchery programs like on the Stamp and Chilliwack that recently we were seeing, we're seeing declining, uh, declining abundances. So I think the in marine environment's a lot more hostile now. So putting naive fish out there, the, the, their fate is more fodder than it is uh, any degree of replacement of wild fish or, or, or augmentation. I think uh, I think Bruce Ward put it nicely. He worked, he spent a lot of his career working on this question. And he said, uh, yeah, hatcheries work when you don't want, when you don't need them to, is how he put it and summed it up really nicely for me at the time. If no more steel had, steel had come back now, from now on, we might still have time to fix the smolt to adult survival problem. So th these are the results from a study that was done in uh, the United States where they looked at the, the um, they looked at the frequency of the in the uh, the frequency of the individuals in a population or groups of populations. The populations were grouped according to how isolated from the sea they were. Uh, so there was a number of populations that represented populations where they were not isolated from the sea and where anatomous fish were present. Populations that had been isolated uh, for about a hundred years, let's say, uh, but that had a reservoir, so like dams. Uh, Populations that were isolated, but for which there were no reservoirs, and uh, populations that were isolated for a long period of time. So uh, inland populations or the populations that were naturally above waterfalls. And what they found is that in the places where steelhead were present, that there was a high frequency of individuals that had the anadromous genes. Uh, in places where it was isolated for a century, but there was a reservoir, so that there was a life history option to migrate downstream to a large water body and, uh, you know, and gain some size and fecundity and productivity advantage in doing so, that uh, the anatomist genes, uh, uh, the frequency of occurrence of those genes was uh, 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 almost the same as the, uh, the, the non-isolated group. It, but the interesting, one of the interesting findings here is that if, if the populations were isolated, say, for about a century and there was no reservoir, then uh, uh, the proportion that had these genes was much, much lower, but was still present. And of course, they, they uh, uh, in the, in, in, but if they were isolated for a long period of time, the genes were absent. So this is suggesting that, and there's other studies that show that, you know, when dams are breached or population isolated for a long period of time, that uh, those isolated populations can come back as steelhead. Hi, Jesse, I see you there and I'm getting close. Okay, we're at an hour and 40 minutes. Oh my gosh, okay. Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get through this very quickly. We're close to the end. Persistence and rescue. Okay, just some points to go through and then we're done. Rainbow, uh, resident rainbow appear to have been uh, supplementing smolt output and probably have done so ever since steelhead ex existed in these watersheds. I think that's pretty self-evident. Uh, they obviously don't have the potential to offset declining effects of uh, smolt to adult survival or else we wouldn't be, the steelhead wouldn't be in the state that they're in. Okay, so that's pretty self-evident as well. They will probably continue to put out smolts for many years if steelhead stopped returning, say beyond 100 years. However, the population may become genetically impoverished for traits needed to survive 
small to adult output. It would be far better to have an adermis fish run back and at least contribute some juveniles to the population so that those offspring from those parents that have uh, successfully survived uh, in, in the whatever marine conditions uh, exist, you know, at least there's some individuals going to see that can confront uh, those those conditions or those the ever changing conditions and then keep coming back and uh, renewing uh, at least contributing uh, some traits to the next generation that are going to be advantageous. Here's the summary, two slides, and then we're finished. The strongest evidence at this time supports the hypothesis that inshore predation has caused most of the decline. There's some evidence supporting the hypothesis that competition in the ocean and ocean conditions have always also contributed to decline. Uh, basically, steelhead on their own cannot sustain fishing mortality at this time if we want to uh, uh, stabilize or slightly reverse the abundance trend. If, if what might be called natural survival. So if survival other than fishing improves just slightly, then fishing rates from zero to recent levels have the potential to dictate whether the population is ready to go up or down. An improvement in survival, uh, apart from fishing between small to adult is needed for recovery. Okay, an improvement in survival uh, between small and adult is needed for recovery. That, I think that's pretty clear to me. Uh, steelhead using the best quality freshwater habitats will persist the best. So quality is important in freshwater habitat. It's not like it's unimportant. It just doesn't have the potential as fishing does at this time to impart a recovery. And maximizing natural adaptation is very important at this time. And there's the end. Sorry about going too long. Thanks, Rob. Awesome. Uh, there's a lot there and I think people are probably still digesting. Uh, I got a bunch of questions here, so I'll try to put some of them together. And I think you, you touched on a few of the questions that came up repeatedly. Um, we've got one from uh, John Waring. Uh, curious, the survival of PAR seems to follow the pattern of coho juveniles. Large reduction survival of fish that remain in rivers and streams over a year seems to be related to loss of overwintering habitat which is destroyed following heavy logging. So I'm not sure if that's in your area, but are you up to speed on any of that stuff? Yeah, the evidence suggests that um, fish that spend a long time in fresh water uh, aren't doing badly because of freshwater habitat. They're doing badly because they're, 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 they're big when they enter the ocean and they're attractive to predators, basically is what the evidence is suggesting. Uh, consider that the Chilcotin, just from the steelhead point of view is, uh, uh, is probably not suffering. Those steelhead are probably not suffering that too much in the way of winter effects. Uh, so yeah, no, I think the evidence leans more to the fact that they're just big when they enter the sea, and it's just coincidental that they spend longer in uh, in fresh water, and you know, maybe subject to freshwater factors. Okay, um, can Mr. Bison, this one's from Alan McEwen, can Mr. Bison share any information about what the historical predator uh, populations may have looked like prior to Europeans, i.e. what was the natural balance in those days? Well, uh, I would defer that to those that are studying this a lot more carefully than I am, or at least have had the opportunity to study it more than I have. But as I understand it, um, um, the case is, is that um, there was a First Nation harvest component on these um, animals at the time, uh, even be, even pre-contact, and to the degree which it may have caused um, uh, sort of like a harvested equilibrium, say, uh, even before contact. Uh, I've 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 heard I've heard I've heard either, well, at least the assertion. If not, uh, I'm not sure how far beyond an assertion might be, but or just uh, I've heard I've heard I've heard. I've heard uh, I've heard it described that way. So uh, I, the um, I think I think I think it's certainly I think it's certainly possible, maybe even probable, that uh, you know seals seals are probably taking on like a problem wildlife type. Uh, uh, they're more like problem wildlife uh, sort of status now because. Uh, there's there's lots of things that we're doing on the landscape that is assisting with seals uh, that that is our advantageous seals like there's more hollowed habitats, uh, you know there's uh, hatcheries there's uh, fisheries there's you know there's things that you know they they can take advantage of and uh, I think they don't they don't do too reasonably badly if they're not 
persecuted. They can do they can do well even maybe better than natural. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think you've answered this one. Uh, this was from Leonard Pagan. Am I under, to understand that calling of seals and harbor seals would translate into more interior phrase or steelhead? I think you covered that. That's the leading hypothesis right now. But, uh, you know, we can't go too much other than evaluating which hypotheses are better than others. Uh, and it, you know, it's pretty much impossible to do experiments on such things on such scales. So the next step forward, if the, if, if the public are willing to take it, uh, is uh, probably an adaptive management uh, process where you try something, you make a prediction of what might happen, you, you, you subject the, the system to say a seal reduction and you watch what happens carefully. That's how to proceed beyond the exploratory analyses and the correlative studies. Okay, thanks. Um, effective nets, I think you covered that multiple times here in the last couple of slides. That came up uh, a number of times, uh, it's been asked. Uh, one from uh, Rick uh, Taylor, any ideas on causes of very low returns on the west coast of Vancouver Island, i.e. Gold River, which presumably are not subject to the same le level of marine mammal predation? Um, or any value on comparing models for West Coast and Salish Sea populations? Uh, the suspicion on the Gold River, um, the, 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 there aren't the data aren't really as available uh, aren't, aren't available. I mean, the seal censuses aren't that are aren't especially detailed, and they're not not as they're not annual or they're periodic. But you know, seals are now present in the Gold River. Uh, they seem to patrol it. Um, uh, there are those that believe that it's uh, could be related to seals. There, there are others that believe that it's largely uh, maybe f f forest related. But, uh, but the, I think, I think um, there, there is. I think the, the 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 history of the Puntledge is an interesting one. That 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 the 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 real pressure that came onto the Puntledge was probably a continued attraction of seal predation by way of the Chinook hatchery. So you know this this predation thing can manifest itself in you know sort of indirect ways sometimes. I don't doubt it. It's possible that it is seal predation as the seal uh, population has grown. Some 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 seals have taken up specialized life histories in rivers uh, and uh, become specialized salmon predators. So I think it's possible. But uh, you know I don't I I don't spend a lot of time out there. I know my colleagues uh, suspect that that's definitely a possibility. Um, and it's not just harbor seals, like in the case of the keel, it could be, it could all be sea lions, it could all be sea lions. There's, uh, that, you know, basically, that are basically, uh, operating in front of the area 12 and 13 gill net and same fleet. They put themselves out in front of the same fleet, you know, uh, a lot of them. So, you know, uh, predator, human predators and, and, and seal predators all lined up in the gauntlet areas. And some of these, and some of these, some of these narrow inlets are, you know, they're, uh, you know, the, the the more the more the more detailed and complex the 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 geography in the hatcheries, it would lend itself to more 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 risk to predation. Like the lowest the lowest uh, smolt survivals in the Puget Sound are for the streams that enter in right at the bottom, like the Nisqually. And the further up you go in the in the uh, in the Puget Sound, you know the the survivals are actually a little better. So the longer the gauntlet, the hypothesis would be, you know, that uh, that might explain why the survivals furthest in are the worst. Okay, uh, this should be a quick one from Chris Chris Ashton. Uh, can you ask where the seal scat study, study took place? Harbor seal scat study. It was a number of haul out locations in and around uh, Strait of Georgia. A lot of them were associated with river estuaries. Uh, um, the repre the rep representative the representativeness of uh, those uh, uh, of those samples relative to the entire population was rationalized in the paper and defended and published. So uh, yeah, but the locations that within about four four or five locations. Uh, one was distant from the river mouths, uh, but uh, like um, uh, east on the, there's a site on the east coast of Vancouver Island. There's a site closer to the Fraser, uh, kind of, uh, I would say may, uh, I won't go beyond that, but, uh, but uh, the paper did claim that, uh, uh, that they weren't too uncomfortable about it being a reasonable representation of, of general consumption. 
Okay, um, one from Andrew Martin. Any information on predation of juveniles from river otters? Uh, I guess that comes from all the sturgeon work up on the Nichaco. Uh, well, we have river otters. Uh, there's uh, well, there's no data on their abundance, um, but we have them in the Thompson. I'm not sure about the Chilcotin. Um, uh, all I can say is that it's nothing obvious from our, you know, our, our, our experience out in the field. It's not like we see, uh, and uh, the degree to which our populations have changed. Yeah, we just, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the extent that we have to the data. We haven't had obvious reason to kind of suspect that or, 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 or at least try to chase whatever data they might, there may be to try to take a quantitative approach to it. But I, I suspect we wouldn't even be, have the option to take a quantitative approach to that factor. So uh, yeah, there's not much I can say about otters. Okay. Um, Eric Peak, is there data to show what Russian hatcheries are producing? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think the Russians are mainly um, increasing pink salmon uh, by way of hatcheries. Um, uh, yes, I think that information exists. Uh, that would at least partially satisfy your answer. I can't provide it to you in any detail right here and now, but I could probably direct you to some that could and some papers that might be able to describe it. Okay, uh, Troy Nelson, this is a good one. Did the numbers of repeat spawn or multiple spawn females just decrease disproportionately over the last 15 to 20 years compared to previous years? Yeah, I think so. There's evidence of that. The frequency of repeat spawning is extremely low, lower than, probably lower than we've ever observed it. It was, uh, um, let's see, uh, what, uh, what's this? the earliest life history study uh, what was the year that was uh, McGregor's life history study in the uh, in the Thompson so that goes back a little ways uh, it was just it was more prevalent then it's much lower now okay um, and of course there's a follow-up around mechanisms or thoughts on why there's such a disproportionate effect or why that number of second spawns are coming down you have any data on that Oh, I think there's just probably more risk, uh, you know, having to go back to sea uh, and coming back. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't, I don't, I think it's plausible. It's just, you know, they had just have to undertake all that extra risk and, you know, their numbers are low going back. Well, they're not that low actually going downstream. It's just that we get so few coming back. So, I mean, they're, they'll be vulnerable to fishing. They'll be vulnerable to predators. They'll be vulnerable to all the risks um, all, all over again. And to the, yeah, so... Uh, it's probably, you know, if the marine environment is more hostile, generally speaking now, regardless of what, what the predators are, that uh, if you undertake more and more migrations through that hostile environment, you know, you know the, your rate of occurrence uh, is going to be lower. That's all that's how I can rationalize it. Okay. Um, I have one from uh, Gary Bigger. It says, uh, sea lions don't leave the Gulf in the spring and the summer. Have you looked at the reports from Will Lucky? on what seals and sea lions eat on the way to sea. Have I looked at a report from Will, by Will Floodkey on that subject? I don't think I have. Um, uh, my understanding is that uh, they're in the, they're in they're inside and they're in the inside waters over the winter. Uh, many of them will leave to go to the rookeries. The rookeries aren't on the inside, they're on the outside. And uh, that's that's I think the general I'm pretty sure that's the general pattern, at least anyways, for sea lions. Uh, the stellars go uh, to the rookeries in, off of California and ours go off the West Coast. And uh, uh, the largest one, I think, is uh, off the north uh, tip of Vancouver Island. So, and, and, then, and then the stellars uh, have rookeries all along Southeast Alaska and down through the Aleutians and right across to the, uh, to the Western Pacific. Uh, but there's two subpopulations, one on one on the Western Pacific, one on the Eastern. Hmm. Okay, I've got one from uh, Shelley Morgan, and this is a, that uh, recent uh, article on um, the compound found in tires and the effect on coho. Uh, anything, any, I guess, any work being conducted or as it relates to steelhead as well that you're aware of? Uh, well, there there was a period of time when um, there was some. Uh, uh, dramatic changes to the Thompson watershed uh, by way of the pulp mill. This goes back to about the 80s or so, uh, but there's there's been nothing like it detected since. Um, 
so we haven't had much cause or reason to uh, suspect pollution. I mean, the there's a lot of water that moves through the Thompson and, uh, and uh, the, the potential for more localized pollution in uh, the tributaries is generally low uh, as long as you don't consider sedimentation itself pollution, but uh, we did have uh, we did have uh, I don't know if it would have translated into pollution, but we did have with our electronic fish counters in the Coldwater River, we do detect in the springtime some uh, some funny spikes in conductivity, and we think that is some um, uh, that's um, uh, uh, some um, the salt from the high from the highway washing into the river. We can we're actually uh, detecting it, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, and there, there was, well, anyway, uh, my, it, minor overall, my, uh, as far as, as far as we can tell in terms of chemical pollutants. Okay. Um, it will give it, uh, so what we'll do is we'll do one last question. It's getting close to nine. So two hours, I feel like it's a limit. And then I do have uh, everybody's questions. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll hand it over to Rob and we'll get written questions out and we'll, uh, share that with people afterwards but we'll go one last one here from Aaron Hill given what we know about hatchery survival being lower do we run the risk of further lowering survival of wild steelhead through genetic integration if we go down the hatchery road yeah i think on balance i think uh there's uh was for, there's first of all there's probably no need for it you have a kind of a built-in hatchery system or be better than a built-in hatchery system with the residents they're going to really help with your persistence for quite a long time um and uh, there are some negative effects to hatcheries that I didn't talk about, like how they can how, how they can pass on maladaptive traits to succeeding generations, and how they can diminish the overall productivity of the whole sum product of both hatchery and wild afterward. That's been published already. So, I think on balance, I think you're better off not to uh, not to uh, not to go with that uh, seemingly good intention, because I, I, th I think, as, as far as I can estimate it, there's a good chance it will do more harm than good. Okay, great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so as I said, we're coming up on uh, nine o'clock. I've got uh, all of the other questions that we haven't got answered. So we'll get answers for those and we'll share them by email and on uh, social media. And, uh, you know, really want to thank you, Rob. You covered a lot and I wouldn't be surprised if we get more questions after this as well as things kind of sink in for people. Um, and for everybody that's tuned in tonight, uh, thanks for your time. And, and as we said at the beginning of the presentation, the big thing here is Rob gives us the science, uh, but the advocacy piece and the political piece is up to everyone that participated. And so it's great now that you have this knowledge that Rob's imparted on you, but if we don't take the next step and take the knowledge to our elected officials and tell them how important these fish are to us as British Columbians and as Canadians, um, we're not gonna have these fish around for very long. So. Um, as we do these webinars and put on these series and do this education piece, you know, the, uh, the responsibility for recovering these fish falls on all of our shoulders, everybody who cares about them. And so take the time, meet with your MLA and your MP, you know, once every three months, it's going to take half hour and talk to them about these interior Fraser steelhead, because we have a number of salmon populations in the Fraser and all over um, BC now that are heading in the same direction. So thanks for your time, Rob. Thank you. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll get you answers to the questions and uh, hope to see you soon. Good night.